The next discussion that we have, and we will continue for a while within this realm, is the family life of the Holy Prophet A number of many important events happened in the city of Medina. One discussion we will have soon inshallah is the grandchildren of the Prophet When Imam Al-Hassan and Imam Al-Hussein are born, how does that change the family life of the Prophet Because remember up until that point the Prophet did not have a big immediate family. He had Lady Fatima السلام, some of his daughters, some of them died, but he did not really have a big immediate family. Now with the addition of new family members, we see the life of the Prophet وآله, you know, uh, being more enriched with that family life. And we see the Prophet وآله, starting to highlight more and more the significance of the Ahlul Bayt when Imam Al Hassan and Hussein are born. So this is something we'll examine in the near future. The wives of the Prophet, some wives of the Prophet, why did he marry them? What happened? The akhlaq of the Prophet at home, the family challenges that he went through, we'll examine that. But in our discussion tonight, I would like to focus on Zainab, whom the Prophet ﷺ married, Zainab bint Jahsh. Because this is a very important stage in the Prophet's life. We find there are many misconceptions about why the Prophet married Zainab. You will find some people who are critical of Islam or some orientalists, they really do the Prophet a lot of injustice when they analyze this incident. So it's very important for us to analyze it properly. Let's go a little bit before that to see how the Prophet married Zainab. The Prophet had an adopted son by the name of Zayd ibn al-Haritha. Basically, Zayd, when he was young, he was captured during his childhood by a caravan, by those nomadic Arabs and he was sold as a slave in the market of Akkad or Akkad. Now he was purchased according to one source, one narration by Hukaym ibn Hazam. He basically is a relative of Lady Khadija salam. Other sources indicate Lady Khadija purchased him. Now when did she buy him as a slave? After marrying the Prophet Now whether uh, you know Hukaym purchased him first then he gave him to Lady Khadija or she directly purchased him, what we know is that she owned him after the Prophet had married her. So now Khadija owns a slave by the name of Zayd. What Lady Khadija does, she was very wealthy so she could afford buying a slave. She gifted Zayd to the Prophet She told him, here's a gift to you. Take him, he's your slave, he can serve you. The Prophet out of his amazing akhlaq, he freed him. But his tribe had rejected him and abandoned him and they no longer wanted him. So the Prophet decides to take Zayd in his care and take him as his adopted son. Because in that Arabian society, it was common for someone to take, you know, a boy as an adop adopted son and he would literally be your son. So we find that the Prophet takes Zayd as his adopted son. One source mentions later the father of Zayd he comes to take him, he tells him come with us, you're my son. Zayd refuses, he says no, this man took care of me, he was good with me, I don't want to leave him, I want to stay under his care. So he refused to go back to his family and tribe when he saw the favors of the Prophet on him and how gently the Prophet had treated him and the fact that the Prophet had freed him. So he was under no obligation to stay with the Prophet because the Prophet had set him free as a slave, but he decided to grow up in the Prophet's care. So Zayd really had a special relationship with the Prophet Imagine someone being raised by the Prophet And that's why he was one of the first Muslims. One of those early people who converted to Islam was Zayd. He was a true Muslim, he was a sincere Muslim. And the Prophet sometimes would even refer to him by saying, my son Zayd. Imagine how blessed Zayd was, the Prophet would consider him his own son. Now, 
The Prophet ﷺ, later on, he wanted, this is now in Medina, the Prophet in Medina wanted to teach a valuable lesson to his society. He realized that these Arabs have an aristocratic mentality. Salaamu yeah. Alaikum. They go by social class. And that there was a problem, even amongst these new Muslims, that if a person from the lower class wants to marry someone from the higher class, they would not allow that. So if a man comes, he's decent, he wants to marry a girl from a higher class, maybe from a wealthier family, the family would say no. Even though the Prophet was so big on taqwa, equality, but they didn't listen. Most of these Muslims did not listen. So the Prophet decided, and he was commanded of course by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, let me break this evil tradition. So what did he do? He went to his adopted son and he told him Zayd. Remember Zayd was a freed slave. He was a slave at some point in his time. Then he was freed. So he comes from the lowest of the low classes. Yes, he was raised by the Prophet, but in the end he was a slave, a former slave. So he doesn't have that high social status and he was not wealthy. The Prophet tells him, I want you to go and marry my cousin Zainab bin Jash. She comes from the Bani Hashim family, very, very well respected. And in fact, her family was decent, very wealthy. They were not poor. But Zaid, for him, this is a big step. You know, how is she going to accept him? So the Prophet says, I will go and propose on your behalf. See how the Prophet wants to break these barriers? Sometimes a leader can say many things from the pulpit. But if you really want people to trust you and that you pre, you, practice what you preach, start with your own family. This man is teaching people, if someone comes for your daughter from a lower class, accept. People are like thinking, will he accept it for his own family? The Prophet said, yes, I'll start with my cousin. She's my own cousin. She's from the Bani Hashim. I'm going to bring her a freed slave. How about that? This shows the sincerity of the Prophet. And this is a beautiful sign, by the way, if you want to know the sincerity of any leader. If you see them preaching, preaching, preaching something, but they're not willing to practice that, know there's something wrong. Everything the Prophet preached, he was the first to practice it. So break these, you know, lines in society, these social lines, social barriers, this arrogance. The Prophet says, I'll start with my own family. And that's exactly what happened. So he went to the house of Zainab to propose. Now when the Prophet went to her house to propose, what did she think initially? No, no, what did she think that who's coming to propose? She thought he was coming and proposing. So she was ecstatic. Rasulullah, my own cousin from Bani Hashim, the Prophet of God. Is there an honor greater than that? She was really happy that the Prophet came to their house for a proposal. Then the Prophet, it's as if he detonated a nuclear weapon on their heads. He came and he said, I am here proposing for Zaid. Zainab was shocked. Zaid? The freed slave, the adopted son? Come on, I'm Zainab, I come from Bani Hashim. I'm your cousin. How can you put me with your slave? Your former slave, he was free at that time, but your former slave. Zainab was not happy. Her brother, who was basically like her father figure, he was not happy either and he told her, impossible. You're not gonna marry Zaid. He's not from our class. So they refused. They refused, they refused that the daughter of a noble man should marry Zayd. Now this is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. He's coming and he's interceding on behalf of Zayd. But they rejected, they said no, it's not easy. If the Prophet were to ask you to do something like that, are you willing? Ask yourself. Something that society will not accept, your family will not accept, Will you still do it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or no? It was a difficult test. So after Zainab and her brother refused, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala disciplined them in the Holy Quran. Allah revealed a verse condemning what they did. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Ahzab verse 36, Allah states, مَا كَانَ لِمُؤْمِنٍ وَلَا مُؤْمِنَةٍ إِذَا قَضَى اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ أَمْرًا أَنْ يَكُونَ لَهُمُ الْخِيَرَةُ مِنْ أَمْرِهِمْ it's not befitting for any believer, man or woman, 
that when God decides something or the Prophet comes with a proposal or something that you say no and you take matters in your own hand. That's not a sign of the believer. A believer is the one who accepts what the Prophet says. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala condemned what Zainab did. Now remember Zainab was a believer of course, even her brother. So when they heard this verse, they felt ashamed. They're like, oh, we got in trouble with God. We did something that angered Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the Prophet, when he recited this verse to them, they're like, we admit what we did was wrong. And since this angered Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we are regretful and we will accept, fine. If that's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us and if that's a sign of faith, we will show faith. So they did have faith, they struggled with this idea, but eventually they did submit. So Zainab, she wasn't happy with this, but in the end she said, okay, no problem. So now, Zayd, the adopted son of the Prophet, he marries Zainab. Soon after, Zainab and Zayd, they don't get along with each other. Problems, disputes every, every day. Zayd would come to the Prophet, he tells him, Ya Rasulullah, this is not working out. I'm considering divorcing Zainab. Now scholars have different understandings of why they would not get along with each other. Some historians believe Zainab, because she saw herself from a higher class, she kept putting Zayd down. You know, I'm, I come from a higher family, from a better family, you come from a low status. And she kept mentioning that to his face and this angered Zayd. You know, it was too much for him, he got fed up with that. So some historians kind of put the blame on Zainab. Even though she surrendered to God's will, sure, but she didn't handle it well. She kept bragging about how she was from a higher status. And remember, it's human nature, it's difficult, it's really difficult. Just, just imagine if, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts you with a slave. Well, there aren't slaves today, but you get the idea, right? Imagine if Allah puts you with that person. Okay, you're gonna live with that person. Will you respect that person and see that person being at your level or no? That's hard, that's hard to do. Even if you accept the idea because God wants you, but will you treat that person with dignity? Not making that person feel that they are lower from you? Can you? Can you live like that or no? Well, 99% of the people will not. Give me an example today, give me an example of someone from a society or from a country that's considered from a very low class. Give me an example. A homeless person. A homeless person. Okay. Imagine, imagine if a homeless person marries your daughter. A homeless person marries your daughter, marries your daughter. Or a rich doctor had married your daughter. Would you treat them the same? And you, you pray Salat al-Layl inshallah, you're a very good decent person. But be honest, would you treat them the same? Would your daughter treat him the same? Probably not. Even if you want to be good and you submit to Allah, but we have that ego in us. You're, you're gonna mistreat that person. You're not gonna give him the full respect that he deserves. <laughs> for most people, for most people, right? But in this case, it's an exception. I mean, if the verse is coming directly from Allah, and if the Prophet is coming, at that point, everything is off to the side as far as ego and feelings and things of that sort are concerned. Wouldn't you say? Well, people right now, do they doubt what Allah has commanded? Do they doubt? When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says you know, through the Prophet that if someone comes with deen and akhlaq, marry him off. Are we accepting that? Knowing that God says that? <laughs> See, people are not following that. Knowing that this is the command of Allah. Well, you're a Sayyid Sayyid though, from that standpoint. As far as the lineage of Sayyids go, isn't it taboo amongst Sayyids to perhaps give it to a non Sayyid? In Pakistan and India, yes. But in, 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 in pious scholarly families, no. In fact, I have a lot of Sayyids from my own relatives who did not marry Sayyids. The female side. Yeah, even the female side. And basically, Assalamu uh, Alaikum. There is also this uh, distinction made on the basis of color. Like uh, a, a fair woman is uh, given more preference than a person who's A dark, dark. yes. 
so than a woman of color. Is that problem too? Because that problem is still after like in this 21st century, it does still exist. Absolutely. So much knowledge. We're still there. struggling with these basics of our religion. Islam came to break these racial barriers. The Imams of Ahlul Bayt, maybe five or six of them married women of color, if we want to give them a label today. Women who came from North Africa, which at the time the Arabs considered these people to be the lowest of the low. But the Imams broke those barriers. In fact, these women that they would marry, look at the praise that the Imams would use in referring to these wives who may have been even former slaves coming from these different countries. The Imams would give them such amazing respect that an Arabian woman would wish she would get that you know, attention from the Imam salam. The Imams, they did what they could to break these barriers, but unfortunately racism is still rampant. It's still alive in our hearts, it's still alive. So I understand the, the, the um, observation that you have about Sayyids and non-Sayyids. And by the way, there are some um, people who think that it's haram to give, you know, uh, your daughter who's a Sayyid to a non-Sayyid, but the Maraja don't accept that. The pious scholars, you know, they really don't accept that. Yes, because Sayyids usually have Sayyid relatives and it's common in that part of the world to give your daughter to someone who's close to you, naturally they will give their daughters to other Sayyids, like cousins, second cousins or distant relatives. That's just something natural. And by the way, even if we assume that this is a tradition that they have, well it's wrong. We're not ashamed of saying that this is wrong. This is something that Islam broke the barrier for. So there might be some families who do that, but are they living by the true standards of Islam? Maybe not. They remember, you know, even, even religious families, they might not stick fully to, uh, to religion. So the Prophet ﷺ, going back to the idea, he wanted to break this barrier. So now there was the dispute between Zayd and Zainab. Some historians put the blame on Zainab. Some historians put the blame on Zayd. They're like, it seems he was rough maybe. He was a good, decent person, but he didn't know how to handle marital problems, right? Maybe his approach was a dry approach. Some historians say we don't exactly know what happened. What we know is they were just not compatible. Sometimes the wife is a decent person, the husband is a decent person, but there's just no compatibility between them. So Zaid kept coming to the Prophet, and he wanted to seek a divorce, the Prophet will tell him no. Ittaqillah, have piety, don't, this is not right, I don't want you to get divorced. He kept coming and coming and coming and coming to the Prophet asking for that divorce until the Prophet realized, okay, there's no chance, they don't want each other, until the divorce happened. So Zayd divorces Zainab. Up until this point, there was no big controversy. Yes, it was a little bit controversial for the Prophet to have Zainab marry Zayd because the Arabs, you know, their understanding of social class are like, well, what is this Prophet doing, you know, giving his cousin who's from a higher class to Zayd. That was a little bit controversial, but not too controversial. Okay, it passed peacefully. The big bomb came when the Prophet ﷺ, after Zayd, Divorced Zainab, the Prophet went and married Zainab after her waiting period, of course. Now the Munafiqeen, the hypocrites and the Jews and the enemies of the Prophet, they found this as a perfect opportunity to launch their attacks against the Prophet Why? And even until today, historians, you know, launch this attack against the Prophet. Why did they make an issue out of it? Yes. Because they treated the adopted son similar to the real son. Exactly, because they accused the Prophet of marrying his daughter-in-law. Zayd is your adopted son, so he's just like your biological son. So if Zayd married Zainab and now he divorced her, how, how did you marry her when she's your daughter-in-law? So they made a big fuss about it, big huge fuss. But this was the plan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah wanted to make it very clear in that society, that your adopted son is not your real son. The laws that apply to your biological son do not apply to, you know, to the adopted son.
Now, this doesn't mean that Islam came and banned, pro, uh, you know, adoptions. Some people think there's no adoption in Islam. Even until today, say, you know, can I adopt a, an orphan and raise that uh, orphan in my house or is it haram? No, of course it's not haram. Adopting someone in the sense that you care for them is one of the best deeds you can do. However, just make sure that you don't consider that adopted son your biological son and hiding that person's ancestry and saying that this is my real son, yeah, don't do that. And also you have to consider the laws of hijab. You know, when the daughter becomes of age, when the boy becomes of age, the hijab with the adopting father, adopting mother, siblings, if all of that observed, in fact, it's a great good deed to adopt an orphan or someone else. Just make sure that you observe those laws. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted the Prophet to teach his society that if your adopted son marries a, a girl and then he divorces her, she's not your daughter-in-law. She's technically not your daughter-in-law because he's technically not your son. Allah wanted to break this tradition because Islam is very sensitive about ancestry, who your biological father is. It has a lot of consequences, physical consequences, spiritual consequences, psychological consequences. So Islam was very sensitive. You need to know who your biological father is. Don't hide that. Don't replace your biological father with someone else. Someone else can care for you and have a greater right in caring for you. But still, you need to know your biological ancestry. Islam was very sensitive about that. Therefore, Allah commanded the Prophet ﷺ to break this pagan tradition of adoption or this Arab custom of adoption by marrying Zainab. And in doing so, the Prophet was demonstrating beyond any doubt that she is not my daughter-in-law. And Zayd is not my real son, he's my adopted son. And there's a difference between a biological son and an adopted son. This was the plan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now today, there are some people who look at this story 14 centuries later, and they put a Hollywood twist to it. Look at what these Orientalists, Orientalists say, unfortunately. And basically this is how the story goes. You know, we have some historians, unfortunately, who have taken some weak hadiths, fabrications. For instance, we have Tabari, we have Ibn al-Athir. They mentioned this uh, when explaining this verse in the Holy Quran that I will, I will recite. They create this love story about the Prophet They say the Prophet, he went to the house of Zayd and he saw the face of Zainab and he was captivated by her beauty so he fell in love with her. When he fell in love with her, he decided in his heart that I want her for myself. She's so pretty, she's so beautiful, I want her for myself. But he didn't reveal that, he didn't make this known to people so he was waiting for the proper opportunity in order to marry Zainab. And as soon as Zayd divorced her, you know, the Prophet went and he married her. This is kind of, you know, the story that's given. Let's look at the verse in the Holy Quran and see how this is a big, big misconception. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Ahzab verse 36, He states, وَإِذْ تَقُولُ لِلَّذِي أَنْعَمَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَأَنْعَمْتَ عَلَيْهِ Remember when you would say to the one whom Allah has a favor on, Allah has a favor on Zayd. By the way, Zayd is the only one who's mentioned by name in the Quran, you know, from the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, the only person in this verse. Remember when you would say to Zayd, the one whom Allah had a favor on. What's the favor of Allah on Zayd? Yes, but more so Hidayah and Islam. Allah showed him and he was one of the first Muslims. So Allah gave him the ni'mah, the blessing of Islam. وَأَنْعَمْتَ عَلَيْهِ And you gave him blessings as well. You, Ya Rasulullah, you took him in your care. You were his father figure. Remember that. أَمْسِكْ عَلَيْكَ زَوْجَكَ وَاتَّقِ اللَّهِ Keep your wife. Don't divorce her. Fear Allah. Remember when you said that to Zayd? Here's where the Quran gets tricky. And that's why you need the guidance from Ahlul Bayt here in understanding the verses of the Qur'an. And you hide in yourself what Allah will later disclose. 
Now what are these people interpreting this verse? That in your nafs you had the desire to marry Zainab and Allah exposed that later. nas, and you're scared of people. Wallahu an But you should be more concerned about Allah, not people. فَلَمَّا قَضَى زَيْدٌ مِنْهَا وَطَرًا When Zayd finished, the, you know, the, the marriage relationship, زَوَّجْنَاكَهَا We made you marry Zainab. Why? What's the philosophy that the Qur'an gives us? So that the believers know they could marry the divorced wife of their adopted sons and that their adopted sons are not their biological sons. So you clearly show that to the believers, that she is not technically your daughter-in-law, she is not. Because a lot of the believers had adopted sons and they were not sure about this case. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is making this very clear. Let's examine this verse and see why the story that even some of these historians have mentioned and these orientalists try to amplify as false. The story goes number one, that the Prophet when he met Zainab in the house of Zayd, he was captivated by her beauty, love at first sight, as they say. Why is that false? How do we know that's false? Right off the bat, how can you disqualify that? house and see No, of course, he's his adopted son, so he would normally go to his son. That part is fine. We can expect the Prophet regularly going to his adopted son's house. It's like his son's house. But what is it about the story that right off the bat you can tell it's fabricated? It's not the first time you've seen it. Exactly, this is his cousin Zainab. He grew up with her in Mecca. He knows exactly how she looks. He's seen her before. But this hadith saying he went into their house after they got married and wow, the first time he was captivated by her beauty. This doesn't make sense because the Prophet knew how she looked like. He had already seen her. So we know there's some problem here, some fabrication here. Number one. Number two, if the Prophet really was desperate for Zainab as these guys claim. Remember when he went to propose the first time, she thought he was coming for her and she was ecstatic that the Prophet wanted to marry her. If the Prophet really wanted to marry her, right, and he had that desire to marry her, why didn't he marry her? When she wanted him to begin with and he went and he proposed and he saw her, why didn't he marry her then? Why did he have to wait later for his adopted son to marry her and then after that, you know, uh, the Prophet would be, would find interest in her. That's another reason why this is a fabrication. So we know the Prophet was instructed by Allah to marry her, not because he was acting out of desire. And the reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also wanted the Prophet to marry Zainab is because now she was married by who? A former slave. That puts Zainab's status down, right? Because now her husband was a former slave. Now Rasulullah was commanded, go and marry Zainab, who was the wife of a former slave. See, even the Prophet was making his own sacrifice by marrying now someone who was lower in status than him. So it was by the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, what about this part? What was the Prophet hiding according to the Quran? What was he hiding? The fact that he loved Zainab as these people say? He knew that they would divorce. See, Allah had informed him that this marriage would not last long and that he would eventually marry Zainab. He had this ilm from Allah. That's what the Prophet hid. He did not disclose that eventually she's going to be my wife. Allah had informed him, but he did not disclose that. And the piece of evidence that points us to this tafsir is in the Quran itself. See Allah says, Mallahu Mubdi, you disclosed, you kept a secret in your heart what God would reveal. What is it that God revealed later? That you have to marry Zainab, not that you loved Zainab. Where did God reveal that the Prophet loved Zainab? That's not something God ever revealed. What God revealed is the fact that Ya Rasulullah, now you have to go and marry Zainab. It was tough for the Prophet to marry Zainab. It would create a bomb in society. But it was by the instruction of Allah and Allah says, later I will reveal that. So see, when, when the Quran says, uh, we'll, get, we'll get to that part. Is, he, is Rasulullah concerned about the optics of how it would look in society that, okay, now I'm 
Yes. Then in the next phrase, the Quran says, وَتَخْشَ nas." You're concerned about people, but you should be more concerned about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Is this rebuking the Prophet? Some people take it that way, that the Prophet is scared of people, not God. How do we address this? Like I said, it's a complex verse. It's a complicated verse. You need the ilm of Ahlul Bayt here. See, the Prophet as a leader is a responsible leader. You as a leader, you have to care about your reputation. The Prophet was thinking, okay, if I go and marry Zainab, imagine the huge controversy that's going to happen in my society. People are going to accuse me, oh, he loved her. Oh, how is he marrying his daughter-in-law? The Prophet is concerned about that. And as a responsible leader, you have to be concerned. The Prophet was fulfilling his obligation of being a concerned leader. If the Prophet is reckless and negligent, like I don't care what my society says, that's not a good leader. A good leader says, no, I care about what my society says, but let's see what Allah says now. If God wants me, I'll sacrifice. So the Quran is training people, be responsible, that's fine. Rasulullah was concerned about what people would say. But Allah should be your ultimate concern. Wallahu ahaqqa an takhshah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not condemning the Prophet or rebuking him for being concerned about the people and not him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this verse, He's stating you are concerned about the people, but remember, not just you Ya Rasulullah, every mu'min, Allah should be the object of your concern. That's how we understand this part of the verse. So Allah is not rebuking him. It's only natural for the Prophet to be concerned. As a leader, you have to be concerned. Think of the consequences of your actions. So this is how we understand the whole situation with the, with the marriage of Zainab alayhi salam. And you know, just the words of wajnakaha, that we made you marry her, just disqualifies all these other versions of the story that the Prophet, he was in love and this is something that he, you know, plotted for. That's not the case. So yes, Zainab bin Jahsh was married by the Prophet not out of desire, not because he needed a new wife, but because this was the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to break this culture of adoption, the way that the Arabs would, would, would do that. And also to break the barriers that, okay, Zainab was married by who? A former slave, Rasulullah, the greatest creation of God, he will marry her too, so what? This shows the humbleness of the Prophet too. So it was by the direct command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They have kids from... Did the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi have kids from Zainab? No, they did not have kids. They did not have any children. I'm assuming she was the one, <clears throat> was she the one after Khadija or no? Oh yeah, this is in Medina. This is years after Khadija alayhi oh, okay. And it's probably even after Aisha. Because now we're talking about maybe, I don't know, year four maybe of the Hijrah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, this is a little bit later on. This is in the city of Medina. So there's a lot of controversy about the story. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of Orientalists, they do injustice to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with this story of, lady, of, of Zainab Alayhi Salaam and uh, you know, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But when you look at the historical facts and we analyze it logically, we find the reasons why the Prophet did marry her. Any final questions of that? Uh, any final questions on that? By the way, one fabricated hadith states when the Prophet went to Zayd's house and the door was open to him and when he was captivated by Zainab's beauty, he said, Subhanallah Khaliq al-Nur, Tabarakallah Ahsan al-Khaliqeen, you know, Subhanallah the one who created light, glory to God the best of creators. It's, see the way the fabrication goes, it's as if the, it's the first time the Prophet is seeing her, whereas we know that he you know, saw her uh, multiple, multiple times before. That's degrading the Prophet. That is degrading, yes. It's also suspicious if he never said anything after the marriage either. Like it's all reserved for before. <laughs> That's a very good point. So Zainab is one of the wives of the Prophet. Inshallah we'll continue further examining the family life of the Prophet and you know why he married other wives. It was all by divine instruction. And then you know in the near future we'll also examine polygamy. Why is it that Islam allowed polygamy, the whole controversy surrounding that, and then 
how is that applicable in our modern times? It's a very sensitive issue, but this is the life of our Prophet. We need to be well-versed with all these, uh, you know, events and incidents.